Garcia is an award-winning author, journalist, and university scholar and adjunct professor in Virginia. She is a USA Today columnist, contributing editor to thegrio.com, as well as a contributing editor, editor to the Washington Post. You can see her weekly on TV as a legal and political analyst. She's a former investigative counsel to the US House of Representatives Committee on Oversight and Reform, and senior camp counsel with the international law firm of Holland and Knight LLP. She is the author of three best-selling nonfiction books, Black Women Redefined, The Woman Code, and E Pluribus One. Her fourth book, Be the One You Need, releases June 28th of 2022. Please join me in welcoming Sophia. Thank you. Come on. Thank you. I think I'm on. Good afternoon. You guys got to do better than that. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. All right. I had music playing. I was going to dance for you, but the music didn't work. So it's all good. So good afternoon. My name is Sophia Nelson, and I am height challenged, as you can see. So I'm going to make sure I stay away from the podium or you won't see me. I'm going to move about. I got a lot I want to get to with you this afternoon. Guys, stay in this session. Do not run. Self-care is for you, too. It's not a girl thing. It's not a your wife and her friends with wine thing. It is an every human being thing. And I just want to say a couple things at the outset as we get into this presentation. And I want to make an observation that I think we all agree on. We are living in very challenging times. We're living in violent times. We're living in politically divided times. We're living in times that if you're on social media, and I suspect most of you are, as am I, People aren't very nice. They aren't very kind. We no longer have filters like we used to back in the dark ages of the 1980s and 90s before we had social media. The things that people say to you now on social media, they could never say to you one-on-one. -on -one. So who's old enough to remember the days like that? OK, it's a good number of us. OK. And the reality is, if we're honest, it's taking a toll on us. Why we continue to do it, I don't know, but we do. And it has infected and affected our homes, our families, the way we communicate, the way we treat one another, our marital relationships, our dating relationships, and absolutely our workplace relationships. We're all walking on eggshells. We're a little nervous about what to say and how to say it and who am I talking to because we don't know what the reaction is going to be. And I'm here today to talk to you about how we learn to better take care of ourselves. And again, men, stick with me. Because I know that socialization for men, particularly men over 40, you've been socialized very differently than some of the millennial and Gen Z and Gen Y young men. Um, you know, you got to be macho. Men don't show emotions. Men aren't allowed to cry. That's all garbage by the way. You're a human being just like we are. And I think it's time that we, I love that there are men in this room because I do a lot of sessions and they're almost all heavily female because all my books tend to skew towards women. But this one is for all of us. And self-care is not what they told you. Self-care is not a day at the spa. That's good. Self-care is not a week at the beach. That's really good. But that's respite. Self-care is not drinking a couple bottles of wine. That's good, too. But that's not self-care. That's respite. That's relaxation. All right. All right, so one of the themes of this conference is cause and effect. It is the theme. And I thought about this a lot. What does that mean? What does that mean, cause and effect? And I think that it's what I said at the outset. I want to make you understand something, if you already don't, which is this. Everyone in this room is energy. We're all energy. How many of you, when you go to work, you have that person that when you see coming, you run the other way? <laughs> How many of you, when you see a certain number come up on your phone, you go, oh no, send it to the voicemail? 
That's the cause. That's the what. It's the energy. Every one of us in here has personalities. We have issues. We got past traumas. We got drama. We got stuff going on. And the what that happens to me, I read a book. Let me pause for a moment. I'm going to do this a couple times. Oprah. Oprah's latest book, What Happened to You. Anybody else read that besides me? Everybody in this room should read that book. Because the what is the cause. What happened in your life, good, bad, indifferent, wonderful, not so wonderful, traumatic, not traumatic. What happened in your life that got you to where you are, that makes you the person you are? We don't spend enough time talking about the what. The what and then the effect, that energy I'm talking about, the people that have the not so good energy, the icky energy, it impacts the rest of us. Every one of us, like I said, has people that we love to be around, and there are people we don't like to be around. And it's because of the cause and effect. Something happens, and then there's a way we react to it. And you gotta keep that in mind, HR leaders, managers, when you're dealing with human beings, you're dealing with complicated people. You're dealing with people that bring a lifetime of stuff with them. And many of you will say, well, that's not for me to deal with at work. Well, you're right. But you're going to deal with it anyway. Because that's how human beings are wired. Okay, so I started with this. And I think we agree that this conference, and by the way, I really want to applaud Johnny and all of the people at SHRM for what they're doing. Because it is so important to focus on emotional mental wellness and health and I think again we see it all around us we're all watching the same news we're all reading the same stories people are isolated they're angry they're unsure they're worried they're fearful they're anxious they bring that stuff to work and one of the things that I want to give you first takeaway first Oprah tweetable aha is this your mental and emotional health is not an option. You can no longer push it aside. You can no longer know that you are exhausted, ladies. Moms, stop feeling guilty. Stop it. You're a human being. You gotta work. You're gonna miss some stuff. Your self-care and your emotional care matters. And we, particularly women, men, you're better at this than we are. Women are socialized, what? To take care of everybody first but us. And we make a lot of excuses when we know we're falling apart because we say, well, I'll get to that later. I need you to know today your mental and emotional care is not optional. It must be a priority. Next, again, Self-care is something that we normally don't talk about in the context of work because self-care by its very definition means I'm taking care of me. But the reason self-care matters for us as a corporate body is, what did I say earlier? That energy thing, that cause and effect. If I'm the boss and I'm not happy, you're not happy. You know, happy wife, happy life, you've heard that, right? Guys, that's true, right? Okay. so. The COVID pandemic, what we know from research and data is this, is that it's not that things got worse, it's that COVID sat us all down and it focused the spotlight on the things we don't normally talk about. The care of self, having everybody in the house at the same time with 10 laptops going, trying to get your kids to school and you're doing the work and the internet breaks down. The dog is not happy because everybody's home and they didn't leave like they normally do. And there's all this stuff going on in your house. And all of a sudden, it's all under one roof all the time. And a lot of people, there are a lot of people sitting in this room, self-included. How many people got COVID? Wow, all of us almost. And when you're laying there, I got COVID the first time. In February of 2020, I was speaking in Baton Rouge. I should be afraid to come to this state. But <laughs> I was speaking in Baton Rouge, big conference, and uh, the governor was there, everybody was there. It was about 4,000 people and giving a keynote. And I started to feel bad. This is February 2020 now. We don't really know. We know that this thing is happening, but we don't really know what it is. And 
A couple hundred people got sick. Congressman Letlow died. There were people who got very deathly sick. I was one of them. By the time I got to Indiana, I was quarantined in my hotel room, very sick. And I can tell you, as you know, depending on how sick you got, whether it's pre-vaccine or otherwise, when you're laying there and you're thinking, this is it, I'm going to die in a hotel room, this is, God, this is not how this is going to play out, right? And you start to think about your life and you start to think about what matters and what does not matter. Who matters and who doesn't matter? And you're thinking about all the stuff that you do and that you did, that you should have been focused on something else that really is what you wanted to do and where you wanted to be. And you begin to think about those things. I'm lucky I survived. I got vaccinated twice. Went to the house in South Carolina. No, they didn't wear masks. Another state, they don't want to take vaccines. Got it again. Got a breakthrough infection. That was mild, it was okay. But then I got really worried, like, okay, this COVID thing is chasing me, this is not a good thing. And again, you begin to process and you think about your life. And one of the key things I want you to understand as we talk about energy and we talk about dealing with our stuff, our drama, our trauma, our issues that we take with us is that you take you everywhere you go. You know that, right? Like, you can't run from you. My Nana used to have a saying, there's a running day and a catching day. And what she meant was, you can try to avoid things, you can try to pretend they're not there, but they will catch up with you. And lack of self-care, ladies and gentlemen, lack of self-care, and again, not this surface self-care they told you, I'm talking about doing the work of you, and we're gonna get to that. But when you don't take care of you, it shows up and it affects you everybody in your life and I'm gonna keep saying that because the only person you can change new newsflash is you some of you me included have tried to change people fix people save people you can't and one of the most healing things you can do is give yourself permission to change you to focus on you to love you and to like you. Some of you are grimacing a little bit. You know why? Because you've been socialized and taught that taking care of you and honoring you and loving you is a bad thing. You need to throw that away because that's just wrong. That's somebody who wants to be what I call a vampire and take everything from you and take everything you got. And they don't want you to take care of you because that doesn't benefit them. You gotta throw that away. I'm going to give it to you straight today. No punches pulled, just truth. All right, what is self-care? By its very definition, it's simply taking care of you. Like I said, it's not this surface stuff that everybody keeps feeding us that if we just go to Jamaica for a week, all will be well in our lives. <laughs> yes, we will have fun in Jamaica. I highly recommend the party boat if you go. <laughs> But self-care, listen to me, is not being selfish. Again, mothers, I'm talking to you, because you're notorious for this. You think that if you take a minute for you, you're being a bad mom, or a bad wife, or a bad daughter, or a bad something. Like I said, men are better at this. Men, like I need this, I'm doing this, and I want to do it. That's socialization, again, particularly for those of us who are Gen Xers and baby boomers. We were brought up very differently. If you're younger, you're probably looking at me like, what's she kind of talking about? And I'll get to your generation in a moment because I think there are things that millennials and younger do a lot better than those of us who are Xers and boomers. But we do some things better too, so hopefully we can learn from one another. But I want you to really, the next aha is self-care is not selfish. It's not. You are allowed. It's okay. And it means really importantly what it says here at the bottom. When you take care of you first, managers, C-suite execs, leaders, when you take care of you, you're setting an example. Your people know when you're fit. Your people know when you're rested. Your people know when you have a great attitude, when you're a positive person. And they want to follow you. They want to emulate you. But when you're the opposite, you're going to have attrition. People want to move somewhere else. They get other jobs. We see this in companies all the time. People don't leave jobs because they don't like their job. 
They leave their job because they don't like who they work with or they work for. That's a fact. Why self-care matters now more than ever? I talked about this a little bit in the outset, but I thought this stat from Google Trends was interesting. That since 2015, and we're in 2022, so seven years, we have seen more than double the searches about self-care. It's like this dirty little secret. I'm going to take care of myself. How do I find that out? I don't know why we're afraid of this. Because we know that we have an epidemic now, and we do. We see it in education. We see it in corporate. We see it in industry. I'm in academia. I'm a professor. When we had school online that first semester of fall of 2020, it was disastrous in the sense of the way it impacted, particularly graduating seniors from college. They're, they're missing things. And you know, I teach legal reasoning and writing. That's not an easy thing to teach online. And at one point, it got so bad, particularly for my males, because the girls talk. The girls connect. They're socialized to cry if they need to, to talk it out, to men or not. And the young men were struggling. I had to call in a girlfriend of mine who's a professor at University of Michigan, and I said, I, she's a therapist. I said, I need you to teach my class for the next two times, and I need you to help my kids because they're in trouble. They just weren't handing in assignments. They basically told me they didn't care. And I'm like, what is this? And I had to stop and realize I was dealing with human beings. They're not just students. They're not just numbers. And I had to do something. So managers, leaders, pay attention to what you see your people reacting to and how they're performing or not performing. And when I brought in Dr. Sabrina Jackson, she did her thing like only she could do it. And then I gave the kids a day off and I told them they had to sleep. And then write me an essay. After they slept, they had to go out into nature, they had to walk, they had to do something, and then tell me how they felt. Their grades shot up, they focused, and they were so grateful that one of their professors noticed that there was something wrong. So again, we're in a community with each other, right? We're in the workplace, and we spend most of our time working. Sadly, particularly now because these things never go off. Again, the good old days of the 80s and 90s where we had no devices and nobody could find you after 5 o'clock. <laughs> you left, you went to the bar with your friends, all was good, you were happy, you went home, you went to work the next day. We are always on now. So the next thing I want you to do is clear the emotional, relational, and physical clutter in your life. Get rid of clutter. You ever see that show on TV with the people that, what is it, the people that store the stuff? The hoarders, right? You guys know we do that emotionally, right? You know we do that relationally, right? Spiritually. It's not, and then it, it shows up in the physical. It's time to declutter. Like I said, let's be honest. We're all just humans, it's no harm. We got a lot of stuff coming at us all the time, and it's not positive stuff. So you have to take time to clear stuff out. Go back to Oprah's book, What Happened to You. That book changed my life. And I had an opportunity. I happened to know her. I was able to tell her and thank her, Oprah. This book was amazing because instead of asking, as many of you do, particularly us females, what's wrong with me, there's nothing wrong with you. It's what's going on with you, what's happening. It's that cause and effect that I mentioned at the beginning. So a great James Baldwin quote, we have to face things to fix them, right? So if you're not willing to face it, if you're not willing to admit you have a problem, you're not going to be able to change it. So managers, leaders, again, pay attention. And if you see something's off or your people are not seeming like they're in the right space, engage. Talk, create sessions and forums where people can feel safe and they can just express themselves. Yes, at work. Okay, what is your EIQ? You guys know what this is, right? Your emotional intelligence is something we all need to practice every day. And in short, your EIQ is simply how you perceive yourself, your strengths and weaknesses, and how you perceive the same in others. And one of the things that's important about this is, again, another aha is 
You got to meet people where they are, not where you want them to be. And in the workplace, that's tough. Because again, you can have somebody that's super brilliant. You recruit them out of school, they're great, but they have to adapt to the culture. Every company has a culture, am I right? Every company has a vibe, energy. So make sure that that EIQ is operating you first, knowing you, and then others. Okay, now let's get into the good stuff from the book. So out of these 21 life lessons that I learned taking care of everybody but me, who can agree with that? Taking care of everybody but you. Okay, there we go. I pulled seven of them that I thought would be helpful to you, again, in the context of HR and work and how we deal with each other. And I will have a signing afterwards. I don't know where that is, Corey, but I'm sure you can find it on your app. So you guys will be the first ones that can get books because they're not even out for the next couple weeks. All right. This is it here. This is the coup de grace. Listen to me. You got three questions that you're going to need to start asking yourself. Three of them. These are life-changing questions, and I don't want you to just ask them once. I want you to ask them often to yourself quietly, and then I want you to listen. What do I want? When's the last time you asked yourself, what do you want? What do I need? Because what I need is different from what I want. Just ask Mick Jagger about that. <laughs> what I need is something deeper than what I want. And then the last one that I know we're not asking ourselves is, how am I feeling? When is the last time you stopped and asked yourself, how do I feel? And when is the last time the people in your life asked you, are you okay? How do you feel? And then in turn, you should be asking those same questions. Because like I said at the outset, we're in difficult times. Let's not lie to each other. The world is going a little mad. Parents, this is a stressful time for you when you have children at school. I don't even have to get into the why. We all know. It's stressful gathering together and being together because we just never know. We're living in a crazy time. So ask yourself often, quietly, these questions. And then listen for the answer and have the courage to do something about it. Next, reframe your thoughts about emotional self-care and wellness. What that simply means is, and again, I'm talking to men more than women here because I think women kind of sort of get this a little more. Men, again, socialization tells you that you really are not entitled. I was talking to a young man earlier, and he mentioned that he had a death in the family. And, you know, he was with his friends, his boys, and he didn't want to break down in front of them. And he said, but then he decided that that was okay because those are his friends. And he should let them see him show some emotion over a very natural, normal thing. You lost somebody you love. And what we often do, fellas, is you rob yourself of deep fellowship and deeper relationship because we're only operating on the surface instead of giving ourselves permission to simply be people. So, again, the only person any of us in this room can change is self. If you can, young people, listen to me. I'm going to save you a lot, a lot of heartache, particularly with bad relationships. Listen. <laughs> when you accept that only you can change you and you can't fix or change them, that's half the battle right there. Giving yourself permission that you are only at the end of the day responsible for you. I'm not talking about kids. That's different. But in marriages or anything else, you can only fix and work on you. The next thing, the next thing is that you need to embrace two words. All of us need to embrace these two words. Number one, no is a complete sentence. <laughs> no means no. You don't have to be mean or nasty about it. I can't or no or not right now or I really would like to help you, but no. Now, a lot of people in your life, particularly some of you like me who give everything and do everything, they're going to get mad when you start saying no. But they will be all right, and they will get over it. So no is a good word. 
This boundaries word is a tricky one. Because everybody in here has the right to boundaries of self-care. But all of our boundaries are going to be different. So again, you have to ask yourself those questions. What do I want? What do I need? And how am I feeling? Because that's going to tell you what you need to put around you to protect you. All of us needs to guard that emotional space that we reside in because, again, we're being bombarded all the time. And again, I think I'm going to keep saying this because you need to hear it is, stop feeling guilty for wanting to take care of you. Stop feeling guilty because you want to go to sleep. Stop feeling guilty because you, you're exhausted and you're tired and, and, and nobody seems to get it. Tell everybody to back up. If mommy's not okay, everybody else ain't going to be okay in here. So you need to let me sleep. You need to let me rest. You need to let me be for a minute. And you're also modeling and teaching your kids and your nieces and nephews and your spouse. When you put those boundaries down, let me tell you what happens. When you start changing you, everybody else around you has to adapt, don't they? Or they'll leave. One or two things will happen. They'll adapt or they'll leave. That's why a lot of people don't change, because we're afraid. This one is obvious, but this is one I really like. Is it hot in here or is it me? I thought I was having a moment. <laughs> Get out of your own way. I wish that I could tell you how many times over the 20 plus year career I've had as a professional, as a lawyer, as an attorney working on Capitol Hill and, and, and speaking at the world's biggest corporations and doing all that I do. This is probably the sum of everything right here in life. Most of the time we are in our own way. Most of the time it's not somebody else. It's not something else. It's because we haven't taken the time to do what I suggested, which is those three questions. What do I want? What do I need? How am I feeling? Because getting out of your own way requires you to actually know that you are in your own way. How many people out here work for folks, know folks, who are super smart, super talented, but they are completely wrecking themselves and have no idea that they're doing it? Anybody know folks like that in the workplace? Okay, a few of you. All right. So what I mean by that is the boss or the leader who, again, stellar resume, everything, but really bad at people skills. Getting out of your own way requires you to know you, and so many of us don't take that time. Remember, you are a human being, not a human doing. Manage your expectations of yourself and others. This one's key because a lot of people will straight up, frankly, I'm going to say it, lie to you and tell you that expectations are bad. That's bogus. You are absolutely supposed to have expectations first of yourself and then of other people you are in relationship with. Well, if you have no expectations, then you can't get hurt. What a way to live. Because you're going to get hurt no matter what you do in this life. Okay? So accept that and you're good. But managing your expectations of yourself and others is key. Everything has to be in balance, folks. So yes, it is good to have expectations, but you also have to do what? Communicate them. People are not mind readers. If you don't tell them, they don't know. But yes, you are allowed to have expectations of yourself. What does that mean? Well, when you're a young person and you want to go to college, you want to go to graduate school, you want to be a doctor, a lawyer, an engineer, a professional, whatever it is, that's an expectation for self. It gives us a road map. Our expectations of other people is trickier because human beings, what did I say earlier? You can only change you. You can't change others, and you can't make other people do what you want them to do, period. So stop trying. And managing our expectations is communicating this is what I expect from our relationship. This is what I want to give. This is what I expect from you on the job when you come. This is what the team's going to do. And when you communicate what you need, life is so much better. But so many times we refuse to say what we need, what we want, what we expect. 
And then we're upset that people don't meet those expectations. Every one of us in this room has been through that, where someone finally goes off on us after a couple years, and we're standing there shell-shocked, like, what happened? What did I miss? I missed the expectations. You didn't tell me what you expected or what you wanted or what you needed, and now you're mad at me. Let's do better. All right, a lot of people say, what does minding your manners have to do with self-care? And relationship with others. Well, I'll tell you, I'll tell you a true story. It's in the book. So I was in law school. My first year of law school was the fall of 1991. And I'll never forget that first semester of law school because those that was when Justice Thomas was being confirmed. Well, we all know how that went. And those of you who are younger, Google it. <laughs> Fast forward 10 years later in my career, I'm a young attorney, I'm on Capitol Hill, and my boss. Barbara Comstock walks in. She was then chief counsel. She became congresswoman in Virginia. And she said, um, got a call from Justice Thomas's office. And um, Justice Thomas would like to see you. I'm like, what, huh? Me? I was on C-SPAN the week before talking about committee stuff, and he happened to see me. So she says, Justice Thomas would like you to come to his chambers. I'm thinking, no, <laughs> no, no. Again, Google it, young people, if you don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> so my mother's here. She's sitting in the front row. And so I go home, and I tell her. And she says, oh, you're absolutely going. I said, no, I'm not. She said, yeah, you are. And I'm going to tell you why. Because he's a Supreme Court justice. You're a young lawyer. She said, that man is not going to bother you. He didn't invite you there to bother you. He clearly just wants to meet you and talk to you. She said, I raise you better than that. You're going to go. You're going to be polite. And you're going to. You're going to go. I was not happy with her. <laughs> but of course, you know who won the argument. She did. And so I go over to the Supreme Court, and I go, and I, I meet with him. And we have this great discussion. And on his walls, Frederick Douglass, Malcolm X, and Martin Luther King. And now I'm really confused. And so you know, we talk, and we have this great conversation. So the man that I see is different than the man that I meet. Very nice, very cordial. All went well. Fast forward another five years or so, I'm getting sworn into the bar of the United States Supreme Court. And somewhere in between that time, Justice Thomas's mother had died. And I sent a handwritten note. We did that once upon a time, young people, handwritten notes. <laughs> and I learned to write handwritten notes and Christmas cards and all that from a guy named George Herbert Walker Bush, who was President of the United States. And I was an intern on his campaign back when he was running for re-election in 92. And he told me about writing a note and having manners and how important that is in your career. That handwritten note makes a difference, he said. Always do it. So when Justice Thomas's mother passed away, I'd sent a note. I'd kind of forgotten about it. Any rate, I'm getting sworn into the bar as usual. I was kind of late with some stuff, and I didn't get my paperwork done. So they told me I couldn't go to the ceremony. And, you know, because I was late, I missed the deadline. My mother was not happy with me, as you can imagine. So um, I said, wait a minute, I know a justice on the Supreme Court. So I called to his chambers, I talked to his assistant, and I said, I missed the deadline, my mom really wants to be there. I could kind of care less, but I want to go. So guess what, he calls me up and he says, it's fixed, we'll see you at the ceremony. What's the moral of this story? The moral of the story is this one right here. I want you to know that everything I've ever accomplished in my life, hear me on this, was because somebody picked up the phone and said, I like her. She's smart. She's good. She'll do a great. I have never applied for a job in my life. It was done through relationships and network or through my sorority or whatever. It's about building a circle and it has served me well because I'm the girl who writes every note, still to this day, will write that note. Writing that note to him when his mother passed, he said, meant the world to him because he said, you'd be amazed how many people didn't write the note. And so when I needed something, I had a little cachet in the bank that I didn't know. And I want you to get this one down because being polite still matters. Being respectful still matters. Listening still matters. Saying thank you actually matters. 
It's like a magic word, young people. Thank you. It opens doors and it keeps them open. Basic respect, a code, is how we get through this thing called life. Don't forget that. Manners actually matter. In my second book, The Woman Code, I would call this Know Your Front Row. My grandmother used to say, you better know your front row. The front row of your life is the most important people in your life. Your circle, Leadership Principle 101 tells us that the five people we spend the most time with determine the trajectory of our lives. Five, a row. Listen to me, your success is somewhat dependent on how smart you are and how hard you work, somewhat. The bigger part of your success is who you know, not what you know. And the bigger part of how you get along in this life and what you do is gonna be about who you listen to. Everybody in here should have a row or a circle of people, mentors, sponsors that you can go to. Young people, this is important. I've had amazing mentors. I've dropped two names on you that you know now. At the end of the day, you've got to be able to have people that got your back, that will tell you the truth. They will tell you, Sophia, another example, get myself in trouble. I was on Twitter. I said something I shouldn't have said. One of my mentors, who is a renowned woman, professor, president, college president, called me up and said, you need to take that tweet now. And I'm thinking, I'm 50 years old. Why I got to take the tweet down? <laughs> but it's, you know, those older women in your life to call and they check you and you're like, okay, I'm going to take the tweet down. But the thing is, she's saying, what you said was right, but you can't say that because you're you. And you have a lot of young women and young men that look up to you. And if you start talking like that, yeah, you should have dropped that word on Twitter probably because we all felt that way. But... That's not what you need to model to the young people. And she was right. I took it down. I apologize. When I'm wrong, I'm wrong. But what I'm saying is you got to have people in your life who don't just blow smoke. You know, yes, people will lead you to the water, and they'll let you drown. So don't have a lot of yes people in your life. You need some real people in your life. Get rid of those yes people. You need a good circle. Now, this is my last life lesson, and this one's big, because you know we're all talking about this one right here. I got in some serious trouble recently about this, and I learned from it. Tweeting is a dangerous thing. I highly do not recommend it. <laughs> uh, Facebook probably gets you in some serious trouble, too. Um, Instagram, probably not, as long as you don't post pictures that you shouldn't post, but listen. I want to be serious here for a moment, particularly young people in the room, I'm talking to you. I think those of us who are over a certain age, again, we grew up at a time without devices and without the constant 24-7 noise. Everyone in this room is a person. You're a human. You have feelings. You have opinions. You have thoughts. Listen, when we're in the workplace, if you look at this room right now, from the view where I am, I love the view of this room. This room is diverse. This tells me that something is going right in corporate America for once. It's getting better. There are men in this room. They're black, they're white, yellow, red, every color. Everybody is represented in this room, and I love that. Because at the end of the day, we're just people. But you know what? We all have different viewpoints. We all see things not the same. Some of us are conservative. Some of us are liberal. Some of us are real conservative. Some of us are real liberal, whatever those words even mean anymore. Some of us marched in Black Lives Matter movements. Others don't think there should have been marching in such a movement. There are people who believe that this country is under attack and it needs to be taken back. I don't know from whom, but people feel that way. I'm being serious. I'm, again, we're adults. Let's talk. But here's the thing. If we're going to do this great thing called America, this great e pluribus unum out of many, one, 1780, Charles Thompson comes up with that as our national motto. E pluribus unum, out of many, one. At that time, diversity was not 
anywhere near what we see in this room when we started. But the great experiment of America, the greatness of us is that we got there. We've had a black president. We have a black female vice president. We've got the first black woman getting ready to sit on the Supreme Court in a month. America is this amazing place that grows and she expands and she opens herself. But that doesn't mean we aren't going to fight. All families fight, am I right? You got families, you got siblings, people you don't like in the family, you don't want to see. We all have that, right? But my point is this. Let's try to show a little grace. Before we jump down somebody's throat, before we run to HR and report them as a bigot or as an ass or whatever we want to report them as, <laughs> take a minute and say, I don't agree with you on that. Or I'm not nuts about what you just said, but can we buy some coffee? I'm asking you to stretch right now. Instead of canceling people, because there's a lot of that going on, and there's nothing like getting your bottom stumped on on Twitter for a month and being splashed in every paper in the country because you said something that people didn't like. I know, I've lived it. It's not pretty. But I'm a big girl. I can take it. I'm on the stage. I'm in the arena. But most of you are just living regular lives. You're not up here trying to make a spectacle of yourself. You're not on TV. You don't, you're just living your life. You know you can lose your job now, right? You can lose your livelihood now. You say the wrong thing about the wrong group, the wrong person, wrong, you're done. That's not right. So here's what I want to challenge you to do. The next time somebody upsets you, offends you, stop, think for a minute. Try to engage in a dialogue if it's safe, if it's smart, if it's wise. You're smart. You know the difference. And what I'm suggesting is instead of canceling each other because we don't share the same politics or maybe my faith tells me something that yours doesn't, I promise you there's something we can find that we can agree on. I promise you there's something about us as people that we can work together on. Maybe we're never going to agree on whatever that other thing is, but let's not lose our humanity because there's a lot more to us than that one thing. So what I'm saying is, instead of canceling, call, call people out. Say, Sophia, that was raggedy. You should have said that. Okay, well, let's talk about it. I don't agree that it was raggedy, but let's talk. And then call them in. Have the courage to call people in instead of calling them out and canceling them. Because nobody in here should lose your job your livelihood, your good name, your whatever. Like the coach, the commander's dude is in a lot of trouble right now. The, the coach, the defensive coordinator. You guys see the story about the Washington commanders? He said something about January 6th. I didn't agree with what he said, but you know, I'm of a school of thought in America that people probably can say pretty much whatever, and whether I like it or not is something I have to deal with. That's being an adult, that's hard. And that's hard in the workplace. And it's hard when we're together because all of us wants to be treated fair and with respect. But I want you to understand that the better way to live, and I'm going to close with this, is to listen, to talk, to have those courageous conversations, again, where it's safe and where it makes sense. And if you can't talk to Joe the jerk at the office, then go get the HR manager and sit down and say, I want to have a talk. I'm not filing a complaint. I don't like this. This happened. Can we talk? And I'm asking us to stretch because our kids are watching. And everybody in the world is watching America because they always watch what we do. And there are some of you here from internationally and international countries. And, 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 but it's true. America is America. And I'm worried about us right now. And I think we all are. And I think that it starts with us loving ourselves and liking ourselves. And I think it ends with us giving each other a break. I think that's how I want to end this. Let's give each other a break and call each other in. Thank you so much for being here today, and thank you for having me. I'm going to take questions now. I'm going to take your questions now so you can come up to the mic. Uh, where's the nice lady who introduced me? There you are. Stick with me. I'm going to take questions if you want, and I'll see you at the book signing. It's in the bookstore. 
It's in the bookstore, by the way. When am I going to be down there? About 2.40 two, two or something? About now. I'll be down there in a few minutes. <laughs> Seriously, you get the books before anybody. Let's do it. Um, you take questions? So questions, anybody? Yes. much this was amazing thank you you mentioned that boundaries is a hard one and for me I had to look at a synonym for boundaries because I struggle with it borders so can you talk a little bit about you know you ended the way that you did I'm really intrigued by that how does that sort of relate to, to boundaries so you talked about boundaries and borders you call it borders it's a synonym okay so you're asking me I want to make sure I understand your question you're asking how it relates to when it's what that that tension between, like somebody violated my, right. So the question that she asked is a good one because I'm sure a lot of you have it. How do I keep myself safe of whatever I believe is right, my values, my code, and then someone at work says something that I find really offensive or objectionable, what's that tension between protecting me and myself and my views versus reaching out to that person. Is that what you're asking me? I think that, again, that's why I told you it's not easy. It's actually not natural. It's counterintuitive, right? But what I'm suggesting we do is the highly evolved people we all like to think we are, and I've been concerned about that a lot lately, given what I see, is that you stretch. And again, as long as a person is not, since, look, we're all smart. You know when somebody has called you an outright name that's, you know, based on your race or your gender or identity or whatever, you, you know that boundary has been crossed. Back up. That's when you need to leave, you know. But when you're talking to somebody who you generally like, you have lunch with, coffee with, and then they come up with, you know, they, they pull out their MAGA hat. Okay, you got a MAGA hat. You're allowed to have a MAGA hat, right? So you, you just, and then some people would say, well, I can't be friends with that person anymore. Come on. You got to do better than that. You got to stretch yourself a little bit. Well, why do you wear that hat? What does that even mean? Tell me. Talk to me about what you, what do you like about that? What, what, ask the questions. Now, if you don't like the answers, you're not comfortable after that, you're free to do whatever you want as a free human. All I'm suggesting is, is that we just give people a break. Sometimes people don't know. And I'm learning, particularly as our culture is changing with diversity and equity and inclusion, Again, those of us who are Xers and baby boomers, this is hard for us because we grew up in a very different, different context. The younger people, all your kids, your nieces, your nephews, it's like the UN all the time. They get it. It's easy for them. They look at us like, what's wrong with you? And we're like kind of, they see us as Neanderthals, right? And they get it. And that says we did something right. But what I'm saying is those of us who are a little bit older have to get out of our boxes and we have to stretch to just hear somebody who's different out. And if they offend you, say, that upset me and that hurt my feelings. Let me tell you why. And then let them respond. Before you report them, before you go on Twitter, before you start World War III, give people a break. That's all I'm saying. I hope that answered your question. Anybody else? Yes, sir. So I don't have a question, but I certainly do want to, I wanted to take this opportunity to thank you. Oh, that's um, kind. So I am um, a senior executive with the Office of the Director of National Intelligence, but I'm also a pastor. So extremely busy, extremely um, focused on other people. But I wanted to thank you for including the brothers in your presentation. I keep saying we got to let y'all in the room. If we let want you to change, room. we got to let you in the room. <laughs> Let us in the room. But I did want to, I wanted to highlight a couple of things that you said that resonated with me and it was something that I had to learn. And so I just wanted to, to just reiterate it to the brothers because the fact that you said it, um, it, it it's, it's, it's powerful. It's simple, but it's powerful. Um, when you talked about, um, it, it's important to give yourself permission to be human because as men and women, Sometimes we hide our emotions, we don't show our emotions, and what happens is we are not our authentic self. And when you can't be your authentic self, it does affect the people Put that are Put a pin in that for a moment. Listen, if Oprah was here, she'd say, 
Aha, tweetable, tweet tweetable. I meant to talk about that. I don't know how it escaped me. I was busy doing other things, but authentic. Being your authentic self is really what this is about, right? At the end of the day, when you ask yourself those three questions, what do I want? What do I need? How am I feeling? And you walk in that, that's when you shows up. That's when the you, you don't even know that authentic you, and we spend most of our time, Pastor, pushing down our authentic selves in order to get along, to fit in, and to adapt to what we think people expect of us, what they will like about us or not like. We do this at work all the time because you're trying to stay out of trouble and stay in your lane and do your job. But some of you are amazingly brilliant at things you don't even know you're amazingly brilliant at yet because you won't let the real you come up. The phoenix, you won't let her or him come up. So thank you for that because that authentic self is real. That's important. And then the last thing I would say is that um, truly you said it, that self-care isn't self-indulgence, but truly self-care self um, instead is, is self um, preservation, and so you did your thing today. Thank you so much. I appreciate you. I appreciate you. Anybody else? I'll take one more. I'll take. Yes, ma'am. Um, so, hey, I just wanted to say your presentation was amazing. Thank you. And um, from a person who really, uh, I allowed my health to suffer, not being my authentic self because I was taught and trained to be a servant. And in my mind, I was being a servant leader, but I had failed to serve myself. Ooh, that's good. And so, thank you. I may write a book. <laughs> <laughs> I encourage you to do so. We all have a book in us, by the way. Um, but I, I want to know. When you say servant, I'm intrigued by that. Were you in ministry or were you in no, something? No, Stop there for a second. She's saying something important, another thing. You can't get to everything, but this is important because where you come from matters. I opened the book with the family. <laughs> we all got one. And you spend your whole adult life trying to overcome your childhood. That's fact. Whether it was good, bad, ugly, indifferent, traumatic, not traumatic, probably very few people had Brady Bunch families, right? But where you come from and your beginnings shape a lot about who you show up as in the world, your racial background as a woman of color or a person of color, an LGBTQ plus person, any, all of these things shape us because they're parts of us that, that are um, like being a black woman myself, understanding grandma, mamas, they have a big influence on what you do. And again, if you're of a certain age, they taught you to be like, I still make my man's plate. Now, I know that that's probably like a not a great thing to say. <laughs> and a lot of guys are like, can you tell my wife to do that? <laughs> but that's a natural thing to do. Like, I, I, I can, I'm me, you know, I'm running around and doing that thing. But if I see he hasn't eaten, I just go. I, it's because I was taught that that's what I do. I can be a powerful, strong woman, but I still should make his plate. I don't have a problem with that, but I don't think that's something you have to do. So my point to your point is, we've all been taught some of that. So don't be hard on yourself. But yes, we were taught as women, particularly women over age of 40 and up, that you still need to play your role and do your thing. And the cultural, if you grew up in the South, it's different from growing up in Connecticut. If you grew up in California, it's very different from growing up in Texas. Different cultures shape you. So anyway, finish your shame, and then we're done. Sorry about that. I just wow. Care of Heart or liver? Uh, kidney. kidney. Yeah. Wow. Because well, thank God you're okay. That's a good thing. And thank God you figured it out. And, and listen, I think I know where you're going with the, with the question. And I think that the point is this. Um, 
And I thank you because it took a lot of courage to stand up here and share that. Because I think a lot of people in this audience can probably relate. Maybe they didn't have a transplant or something serious, but they've had incidences where they thought they're, I've been to the ER a couple times. Am I having a heart attack, doc? Doc's like, get out of here. You've got a perfect heart. You're in great shape. You're stressed out. You're not living the way you should. You're not telling people no. You're not taking care of you. And that, folks, listen, cardiomyopathy, grief, loss, the stuff we do, it will kill you. You all saw the man who died after his wife was shot at the school. He went, put his hands on the cross that they had made, went and sat back down, his kid said, and just killed over and died. He was a healthy man. It was the grief. And I'm bringing it up to say that what you're saying, the physical and the emotional and the mental men, real important. When you're in what they call the heart attack years, those 40s and 50s, 60s, you got to take care of yourself. And women now are having the same factors as men because we're working the same with the same stress now. So please take your health seriously. Take this self-care thing seriously, please, because it really matters. You want to finish up? Just to finish up, I, I ended up having a stroke. And Jesus. So many things happened, but um, I found myself once I started feeling better, just walking back to the same behavior. And so I was hoping that you could speak to how do we, how do we avoid falling back to the behaviors that has been a detriment to us because we still have our families she wanted to say that different but she just had to let it out so let me ask you a question like this I got you here's the thing you remember what I said that at the end of the day you can only change you I have learned that that's where I need to stay meaning if I try to change my father, my mother, my sister, my brother, my whoever, I'm going to drive myself crazy. And you got to understand that, listen, when you begin to change, everybody notices because we all have roles to play. And people don't like when you start saying no or you shift. The only way you take care of yourself is you stand in your truth and you say, this is for me. I still love you, but... If you want to be dysfunctional, you do you over there. No, that's real. You have to be able to say, I love you enough. I got you. But this thing, I'm not doing. There are people in my family I don't fool with. I love them. I pray for them every night. I give them to Jesus because I can't do anything with them. Because if I try, it's going to take me out. There are people that are in relationships sitting in this room right now. Statistically, I know that there's somebody in here who's being abused. There's all kind of things going on that they don't talk about, that they can't talk about, and they keep trying to think that if they're just better, that other person will get better. No, no and no. All you can do is fix you and heal you, and when you do that, all is right with the world. You've got to set those boundaries. You almost died. You had a stroke, and you had a kidney transplant. That, if that's not enough to set you straight, I, I mean, am I right? Like, at some point, you got to say, wait a minute, time out. I'm doing this for me, and it gets back to boundaries and the word no. And that's the only answer I could give you because it's not a simple answer. I know that when we have spouses and you love your spouse, but your spouse is a jackass, what do you do if they're not going to change? Uh, you, 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 Right, or, or if your mother or your father or whoever, they're toxic and you're getting better and they want to stay in their, you know, whatever their addiction or whatever it is, it's hard for you to be healthy when you have unhealthy people around you. But all I'm saying is to all of us, me included, is the only person I can fix is me. And I got to learn to do what's best for me even when it may be not good for somebody else. And that's the tough part. That's where the rubber really meets the road and you have to do your best to take care of you because what happens if you're not here? And I say this to my friends all the time and have young kids who are just stressed out and not doing well or they're in difficult marriages. I'm like, but what are you going to do if you're not here? If you drop dead, what do your kids have then? What are you going to do? So you got you to pull it together. You got to take care of you. It's better to hurt somebody's feelings and tell them you don't like something they did or you guys need to work on something versus you just giving yourself a stroke or a heart attack. All of us in this room, this is real. This isn't make-believe. We're seeing it all. And young people, this happens to you too. 
you're never too young to have a stroke or a heart attack, God forbid. We used to think that that only happened to people of a certain age. That's not true. We know we're all under too much stress. So thank you for your question. Thank you for your resilience. Thank you for being a blessing to everyone in here. Thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, I'll meet you down at the book signing thing if you want to come, and thank you. <laughs>